for coming here today evening and as is mentioned I'll speak on the topic of understanding what is our inner power and how we can tap it I'll start with two different examples that we all have outer powers we consider some people may physically very powerful some people may financially very powerful some people may relationally very powerful they have contacts with big people these are all external powers and they are all important but if we take a broader perspective we humans are one species among the many species on this planet and in terms of external powers actually there are many other species that are much more powerful than us the elephants are much bigger in size than us there are animals which like deer or cheetah which can run much faster than us so in terms of external powers animals have far greater power than us at the same time we humans have in many ways arisen to the top of among all species and we are ruling the planet so is there something which we have which raises us above the other species and yet there is something else no other species is known to destroy themselves the way we humans do that destruction can be sudden and drastic as in suicide suicide according to estimates 1 million people commit suicide every year that's one suicide every 40 seconds now there is so much concern about uh, gunmen shooting at innocent people but far more than number of people who are killed by gunmen are the number of people who kill themselves so no other species is known to commit suicide the way humans do sometimes some animals may die pine away in grief or say one sheep walks off a cliff others may walk off but intentionally ending one's life is something which no other species does at least not at the scale at which we do and that is just one ex one thing we have self destruction which may happen in a shorter way in a slower way through self destructive habits somebody may it may be smoking drinking drug addiction is now a big problem or if we consider the animals animals also get trapped by their own actions at times a fish is caught by a bait a uh, mouse may be caught by cheese in a mice trap but neither the mouse or the fish know in advance that it's a trap and what they are attracted to is food for us humans when we smoke or drink or take drugs No, by no stretch of imagination does a cigarette look like food to anyone and who doesn't know in advance that it's injurious to health so there is something within us which can make us much more powerful than other species at the same time there is something within us which can also make us could say dumber than other species we end up doing things which even they don't do so what is it that that is that can be our inner power and which is also our inner weakness at one level we could say it's intelligence we humans have a more well developed brain we have a greater capacity of intelligence and that is true but at the same time intelligence alone is not what really decides people's lives all of you probably know people around you who are we could say wasted talents they are intelligent but somehow they are not committed they are not focused in sports especially we may see some players are very good in, they have very good skills they have a lot of talent but they don't have much temperament and they cannot even tap their talent in fact that was one of the defining such was one of the defining experiences that made me seriously start looking for understanding the inner world when i was studying my engineering one of my models 
was a student who was two years senior to me and he was outstanding he was a university topper in all the eight semesters in our engineering which was six, four years eight semesters and he was brilliant i studied electronics and tele telecommunications engineering so he was brilliant in that and yet uh, he was a chain smoker and i would ask him you know why do you smoke? He says, it just feels good. I can think faster when I smoke. I started think. I was thinking at that time, you know, he can solve sums, solve or get electronics concepts, solve equations, like nobody had known. Why, why doesn't he get the simple point that he's hurting himself, he's harming himself? When he passed out, at that time he got the highest paying job in the history of our college and yet within six months when he was working at that job he was diagnosed with advanced lung cancer and he succumbed he died so that was a very sobering incident for me here if we say intelligence is the power he had intelligence phenomenal intelligence but there's something which made him destroy himself. So we could say that there is intelligence can have two different aspects. One, one aspect of the intelligence could just be talent. Some people are just good at math, some people are good at physics, some people are good at language, some people are good at music. Now talent we don't normally equate with intelligence, but we could say talent is more of functional intelligence. If you're, if you're talented in music, you just know which notes to press, how to combine different notes. If you're a talented language, you just have how to combine this word with this word. What will rhyme over here? Just get it. So we all have by nature been endowed a certain amount of talents. And this specific intelligence with respect to talents is definitely a great power. But whether we will be able to use it or not properly, that is determined by our temperament. Our temperament is our, I could say, emotional stability, our emotional maturity, our capacity to make right decisions. Now here we are using right, not in a moralistic sense, but simply right in the sense that which helps us to grow, that which is beneficial for our growth. So we all have this tendency, something within us which sabotages us. The British author Oscar Wilde, he said that giving up smoking is the easiest thing in the world. I have done it over a hundred times. <laughs> 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 I have done it hundred over a hundred times. So give us smoking, but smoking it doesn't give us up. It comes back, it proposes, and it catches again. So this capacity to choose our actions wisely, and before that, to process our emotions wisely. Why would somebody smoke or drink or take drugs, or at a lesser level, these we could say are uh, very destructive habits. A lesser way we might destroy ourselves is by just getting hooked to entertainment. Entertainment is not bad. It can just be a refreshing break in life. But for many people, they just become so hooked to entertainment that that becomes their real life. Everything else they want to finish so that they can get with entertainment. And it can become a severe amount of... Uh, it can cause a severe amount of inability to function in real life. Because one is so caught in the... Uh, digital world so basically why would we not tap our talents why would we act injudiciously either say it could be suicide or addictive self-destruction or just simply endless distraction we in today's uh, multimedia social media high-tech world we often end up in a situation where we are distracted from distraction by distraction. We're supposed to do one thing, get caught in another thing. And while doing that, we get caught in another thing. 
and then another. So that just goes on. So why does this happen? Why do we get sabotage like this? Broadly, it is because we are unable to process our thoughts and our emotions. I mean, I just want to feel good. And whatever will make me feel good, I want to do it. And I want to do it right now. Or I'm feeling bad and I don't want to feel bad. So in order to not feel bad, whatever it takes, I'll do it. Many times when people smoke or drink, it's not so much because the smoking or drinking is so enjoyable. It's just that that has become a habitual pattern of seeking relief. And not doing it causes some pain, causes some irritation, causes some discontent. Now to understand what is happening, uh, why we are making such imprudent choices. All of us, now how many of you have looked back at your life and felt, hey, why did I do that? Has any of you felt like that? Why did I do that? Is it? Thank you for your honesty. I would be the first, I would be the first to raise my hand. <laughs> it happens to all of us. Why did I do that? Why did I speak like that? Why did I do like that? Why did I? It just happened to us at that time. So, there is something within us which just uh, overwhelms us. So to understand what this is, I will use two metaphors. Mm -hmm. And I will do a thought experiment to illustrate this metaphor a little later. But many years ago, maybe 15, 16 years ago, I, had, I was supposed to go for a meeting and I was late. So I had to catch a train. So I took an auto came to the train station and I knew the train was going to leave. Just rushed into the train station, caught the train and was relieved. And then because it was an important meeting, I was preparing for the meeting. And then after half an hour in the train, I was just looking, you know, when is my station going to come? And then it suddenly at that time it struck me, I had caught the wrong train. <laughs> <laughs> so I just came to the station and I knew this was the time of the tra train. So whichever train was there at the station, I just ran into the train and caught the train and the train left. And I was so happy that I had caught the train that I forgot to check which train it was. And then I was beating myself up. What a fool I am. Then I had to do that meeting on phone and it was a big mess. So the point which I am making over here is that sometimes if we are very hasty, we know I have to do something, but what exactly I am doing, in the, we may not pay attention to the details and that can harm us so our inner world is like a train station and in this inner world there are many thought trains that are there so there are different thought trains that are parked over there and whichever thought train we get into that train starts off and it starts moving and some thought trains may take us where we want to go and some may take us far away from where we want to go. So we are like the person who gives energy to the thought train. So when, we, when we enter into a thought train means that there is a particular stimulus, particular thought that is there and we start thinking about it. As soon as we start thinking about it, okay, this may lead to this, this may lead to this, this may lead to this. And then our thought can take us in many different directions. So, say, if I'm working at a job and I come to office and I see a strange look in my boss's eyes and the thought train of worry starts off. Was my boss looking at me like that? Are they planning to fire me? <laughs> oh, if they fire me, what will happen to me? Oh, if they fire me, I won't have any money. If I don't have any money, how will I pay for my mortgage? If I can't pay for my mortgage, then I'll be evicted from my house. If I'm evicted from my house, I'll have to get a new house. If I don't get a new house, I'll be on the streets. Oh, how will I live on the street? It's so cold. And we may be feeling cold there because it is air conditioning and we are worried oh it may be cold out there so what happened here in this case the thought train of worry started off that strange look might have been for any reason 
we don't know that what reason it is but we just ascended thought thought train and it took off similarly our thought train may go off in another direction say it could be resentment we can be resentful or even revengeful say we come to a come to a party or a meeting and we greet someone and that person doesn't greet us back this nabas immediately anger erupts you know what happens is there's a there's a train of anger which is just waiting in our in the world we just get into it and it just zooms off <laughs> there has some of these uh, power engines you know just press one clutch and it just catches it high speed so like that you know it's not how dare it does like that you know i'm going to show them next time in front of 100 people i'll stop them and then we start thinking i'll do this i'll do that maybe i'll do this over here maybe i'll do that over here and one moment we are peaceful and purposeful and the next moment we are wild so what happened is thought train just went off so when the thought train starts off it can go in any direction and we have to be careful to, to choose which thought train we are getting into mental health problems are a major issue in today's world last year when i had come to america i was speaking at a mental health care center in new jersey so <clears throat> there one of the counselors i i took a i gave a talk in the hospital to the counsel mental health care providers the counselors so one of the counselors after the program was telling me that actually when people need mental health care basically they need it because they are unable to process their impulses see all of us may get angry now some of us when we get angry we may just give the other person a, the silent treatment just don't talk with them at all some of us may just become irritable and snap at them some of us may just walk away in a huff some of us may just you know throw something down disrupt some things some of us may become physical and hit out at the other person some of us may take a gun and shoot the other person also so all of anger is just a fact of life every one of us will get angry but the, when the impulse of anger comes what do we do after that if the impulse starts making us behave in destructive ways where we physically hurt others or we physically hurt ourselves all of us life will sometimes treat us badly and we will feel depressed now when we feel depressed what do we do if some people may just oh i just want to be alone for some time i just want to go and party some people when they feel depressed they use retail therapy just go and buy 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 <laughs> i feel good when i buy things <laughs> so all of us will feel depressed and all of us will find to find different ways in which to deal with depression but if somebody when they get depressed they decide to commit suicide then that is a destructive response to that it is a destructive impulse and then they need to be put on suicide watch they have to be monitored they cannot be allowed to be alone so basically all of us have impulses and if those impulses lead us to destructive directions then that is where our mental health becomes very unstable now among mental health problems there are two broad categories of problems one is depression and the other is anxiety if we consider what happens in depression and what happens in anxiety in the light of this train station metaphor we are right now sitting at this particular place and we are in the present so you are hearing what i'm speaking and i am looking at you so we are in the present so when anxiety happens basically the some stimulus that comes in the present and that stimulus causes our attention our consciousness to race off into the future when the thought train rushes off untrammeled unrestricted into the future 
then that is when worry starts. So now we don't need to go into the future, but that is in a thoughtful way to plan and prepare for the future. The difference between worrying about the future and planning for the future. The difference between the two is who is in control. When our th when the thought train takes off against our will, okay, this may go wrong, this may go wrong, this may go wrong, this may go wrong. And then the more we think, the more we feel disempowered. <sighs> this may go wrong, this may go wrong, this may go wrong. So it's like our thought train is going off somewhere into the future and the future seems to be just a series of horror movies. You know, this, 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 this. And here the thought train is going so fast that when we see one negative scenario, before we think of, okay, what can I do to deal with this? How realistic is this? How can I prepare for this? Before that can happen, the thought train goes off to another negative scenario. And then another negative scenario, another negative scenario. And then it goes off in a loop. Now suppose we have a fan. Now normally the fan, fan goes round and round and round. When the fan goes round and round, it has a lot of kinetic energy. But because it is stuck to one place, it doesn't move anywhere. Often our mind goes round and round and round like that. At least when the fan goes round and round, it cools the room down. <laughs> but when our mind goes round and round and round, it heats us up. Oh, we just get agitated completely. So when the thought train goes off uncontrolled into the future, then it causes worry. This may go wrong, that may go wrong, that may go wrong, that may go wrong. And before we can analyze anything, again it goes, this will go wrong, this will go wrong, this will go wrong. We just feel extremely powerless. And conversely, if the thought train goes back into the past, oh, you know, this went wrong. This went wrong, this went wrong, this went wrong. That causes depression. Depression is caused primarily when we obsess over the bad things that have happened to us in the past. And we make ourselves feel bad and then we start thinking that the future is going to be more of the same old story. Now something may happen. And when I was talking with this uh, <coughs> this uh, uh, mental health care provider is telling about one girl he said that she attempted suicide and she was brought to the hospital and she somehow survived and what was the reason she committed suicide he says she called up her partner and a partner did not pick up the phone and because of that she felt so rejected so oh, you know he doesn't love me he doesn't care for me i'm unloved and you know, you know this relationship didn't work out that didn't work out this happened like this that happened like that that happened like that oh i'll never be loved by anyone i'll always be alone throughout my life what is the use of such a life let me end my life now somebody is not responding to one phone call it's not such a big thing there will be 100 reasons why they don't pick up the phone call at that time but what happens <laughs> that phone that phone call not being responded to that started off a thought train and that thought train was this went wrong this went wrong this went wrong therefore this is also going to go wrong everything is going to go wrong in my life so when our thought train goes into the past to all the wrongs that have happened that causes depression so basically uh, our inner weakness is that we don't watch which thought train we are getting into like i thoughtlessly got into a particular train which was going away from my destination similarly we get into unwanted or unnecessary thought trains and that is our great weakness conversely our great strength is that even if a train is right in front of us we can choose i am not going to get into this tree we have greater capacity than all other species to resist our impulses many of us 
uh, we may fast. Some of us fast for religious purposes. Some of us fast for health purposes. <coughs> we all have the capacity. Although hunger is a natural bodily stimulus, uh, but we can say, I'm not going to eat. So some people can fast for one day, two days. Some people can fast for 10 days. Some people can fast for a much longer time also. So now hunger as a stimulus comes with it. It's like in our inner world, I'm hungry, I'm hungry. Give me food, give me food, give me food. It's a very strong impulse. If a cat sees a mouse, the cat can't think, hey, today I'm into fast. <laughs> <laughs> the cat doesn't have the capacity. Once that food impulse comes within it, the food comes in front of it, the impulse comes, I have to eat. It just pounce on it and try to eat it. So on one side, we actually have the capacity to resist our impulses far more than other species. But we need to exercise this capacity. If we, if we exercise the capacity to evaluate our impulses and then act, we can become stronger than many other species. But if we don't, then our impulses can cause us greater destruction than other species also. Now to understand this point that we have the capacity to evaluate our impulses, to choose which thought train we get into, I would like to, to illustrate this, I would like to do a thought experiment. So wherever you're sitting, try to become relaxed over there and then you can close your eyes <laughs> and with me you can take three deep breaths one try to take as much air in as possible and let it out as much as possible two Now, with your eyes closed, look at what you see in front of you. Because your eyes are closed, you can't see whatever is ahead of you. But still, there is something like an inner screen on which you may see various things. You may see something in this room, you may see your own room at home, you may see a friend, you may see your phone, you may see a garden that you have visited, you may see various images coming and going on that inner screen or you may just see a colorless haze as the inner screen. Now, as you are watching this inner screen, observing the various images there, try to take a step back and look at who is observing that inner screen. You can see an inner screen, but try to take a step back and see who is observing that inner screen. Try once again. Let's take a step back and instead of looking at the inner screen, try to look at the inner seer of that inner screen. No matter how many times you step back, the observer steps back with you. What you are looking for is what you are looking with. You are the inner seer. Your mind is the inner screen. You are a spiritual being, the soul who is observing the mind. You can take one deep breath and then you can open your eyes. Thank you. <coughs> so right now, when you open your eyes, the inner screen is still there but that inner screen is acting like a window just like by this window I can see the trees outside similarly right now you are the inner seer 
there is the inner screen and there is the outer scene so the outer scene right now is this room and the outer scene gets projected on the inner screen and we respond to the inner screen what is seen over there but this inner screen doesn't always function only as a window sometimes it can start functioning as a tv monitor and suddenly something else starts coming so that's when we get absent minded we are physically there but our mind has gone somewhere else mind has gone somewhere else means on the inner screen something else is being displayed so going back to the earlier points about anxiety and depression when this inner screen goes back to the past when the inner screen starts displaying images from the past that is when we get caught in anxiety and when the inner screen starts becoming a tv which starts showing a horror movie about what all may go wrong in the future then we get anxiety what appears on the inner screen is not always in our control just as sometimes people in the outer world may behave in uncontrollable ways and that will appear on our inner screen we can't control that but along with that suddenly sometimes for no reason we might just start feeling bored we might feeling gloom we might start feeling gloomy we all have our mood swings so suddenly something appears on the inner screen and we can't always control what appears over there but we can control whether we focus on it or not now to develop this metaphor a little further if you consider the inner screen imagine it's a very big screen and on that screen there are multiple windows open now suppose sometimes some people have very big monitors and on the monitors you can have two windows open or three windows open so if say there is a security building high security building where there are five there are many doors and from each of the doors there is a cc close close circuit tv camera which is coming on this uh, on the security room where there is a big monitor and what is going on in all the rooms is seen so similarly for us on our inner screen multiple images appear at the same time and we choose to zoom on a particular image say so right now when i was speaking somebody is coughing behind now a cough is a familiar sound so it doesn't we it pops up on our inner screen yeah somebody is coughing that's okay but if somebody is sort of coughing start screaming that's happened. what happened we look back immediately so what happens there is much that appears on our inner screen but we evaluate we process okay this is not so important let me put it aside it's important let me focus on this so normally for our proper functioning we need to be able to process what should be prominent on our inner screen and what should be pushed aside or what should be we could say minimized yeah okay sometimes if you are working on a computer and suddenly the computer gives a notification a software update is available do you want to update now now the notification we can't stop it from coming but we can evaluate okay i am doing some urgent work i can update this later so we say remind me after an hour or remind me tomorrow so we can't control what pops up on the computer screen but we can control what we do with it similarly for us thoughts some things will just pop up either they pop up because of some outer outer perception like i said somebody screaming that's alarming outer perception or it might pop up also because of some inner recollection suddenly we remember something now when this pops up if we are not careful then we get carried away by it it pops up and we identify with it and it's like a movie starts over there and we get caught and sometimes some softwares they install on their own we download something from a computer from our internet and do you want to install this yes or no now normally the option would be no but sometimes the default option is yes unless you change it to no it will go on install itself and sometimes some softwares are so insistent that they say if we don't click no within the next 30 seconds they'll start installing so like that 
when we form a habit of something when something is a habit means what habit means the space between stimulus and response becomes lesser and lesser and lesser if i am habituated to something then when the stimulus comes and when the response happens it's, it's almost instantaneous say so imagine if there's some software which comes up which is going to install itself and it says do you want to install now and it gives you only 5 seconds if you don't say no it will start installing so like that when we become habituated to something the stimulus pops up and we do have the option to say no but if it's a habit strong habit means the stimulus and the response are so tightly tied together that it's almost impossible for us to re to respond and bring a wedge in between the two so somebody is a worrier some people just worry a lot and for them and a worry is just unavoidable in life all of us have a lot dependent on things that are not in our control and when something is not in our control and that is important for us it's naturally going to cause worry but for people who are habituated to worrying one uncertainty just comes and as soon as the uncertainty comes it starts a horror movie immediately and before they can stop it it's just gone they're lost so basically our inner weakness is the is the shortness of the distance between the stimulus and the response the lesser the distance the weaker we become for somebody who is an alcoholic as soon as they get the thought of drinking immediately i have to drink now and that is so the shortness of the distance between impulse and response that is our weakness and the capacity to lengthen this distance that is our strength the lengthen the distance means it's not necessary that every impulse that comes i have to say no to it some impulses may be natural okay i feel thirsty i want to drink some water let me drink that's fine but if i have to do some test for which i have to fast from water i feel like drinking no i will not drink so basically the greater the distance between the impulse and the response the greater will be our capacity to choose which thought train we enter into so on that inner screen this inner screen is another metaphor to the train station in the train station there are many trains similarly on the inner screen there are many windows that are open and some windows will just zoom up and unless we minimize them they will stay zoomed up and they'll start a movie over there which will just go on but if we have developed that inner discernment that inner capacity to observe and analyze then we can evaluate whether this movie needs to be maximized whether this window needs to be maximized and whether it needs to be maximized now now how do we develop this discernment so how do we go about say when something which causes me worry comes up in my mind somebody does something which causes me anxiety something happens and then how do i increase the distance between the impulse and the response for that first thing is intelligence our intelligence here i talk intelligence in terms of our capacity to know that we are different from our thoughts the thoughts are coming in and i am different from them this to the extent we understand this to the extent we will evaluate we tend to very uncritically accept our thoughts and believe those thoughts and just go along with them but when we learn to evaluate okay, i am different from my thoughts then who am i so the bhagavad gita is a ancient uh, yoga text and it describes that we at our core are spiritual beings to the extent we realize that we are spiritual then to that extent we don't get carried away by what happens at the level of our thoughts so like i earlier said the inner screen is the mind the inner seat is the soul 
Because the first step is to understand that I am not the inner screen. I am not what is happening on the inner screen. But then who am I? I am the inner seer. I am the soul. So the more we can situate ourselves at the spiritual level of understanding, the more we will become able to observe our thoughts and select our thoughts. Okay, this I want to go along. This maybe later. This no need at all. And this capacity to process our thoughts can dramatically transform our capacity to tap our talents and to make wise choices. So I'll conclude with two points now. First is, how do we situate ourselves at the spiritual level? And lastly, how can we, how can we more promptly get off a train if we have somehow got into it? That will be the last point. But situating ourselves on the spiritual level can help evaluate last year when I had come to America I had gone to I was in Florida when the hurricane Irma hit so I left Florida I came to New York to give some talks one of my friends was on a retreat over there he was in a writing retreat so he cut himself off from the world just he could focus on writing and then he just uh, came out and looked out of the window and he saw water everywhere Hey, what happened? He came back and he tried to uh, search on the internet. There was no net connection available. He tried to call on the phone. There was no phone available. Then as he was watching, the power also went off. And now we started getting alarm. We went to the window again and saw the water was rising. And he, wa he had just go gone to another friend's house, which is like an isolated place, almost like a ca cave in. And he, he was in... It was a retreat for him, but now he had nowhere to retreat. <laughs> the water was coming, coming. He's looking around what to do. There was no way to go, no way to contact. And as he was looking around, the power had gone. It was, uh, he turned on his flashlight of his phone and was looking around. And suddenly he noticed that there was a closet and behind that, there seemed to be something like a door. So he just pulled the closet aside and then tugged at the door. And then he saw a narrow fleet of stairs up. And he ran up and there was an attic, a small attic over there. He had not noticed that it was existing also. So he just went up and he was there in the second, and that's in that, in that second level of the building. And then he was looking out, the water rose, rose, rose. It inundated the first level, but he was safe on the second level. And then after the water, after that the water level went down and then the net came back and he was rescued. So he did not even know that the second level existed. But because he found the second level and he found a way to the second level, he was saved amid the danger. So similarly for us, our existence we can say has multiple levels. We normally live at the physical level of reality. Okay, I, I want to do this, I want to achieve this, this is going wrong, let me fix this. But sometimes, some problems come and they overwhelm us so much that no solution appears to be there. It's like a flood that is coming and there's nothing that I can do. If at that time, we can discover that, oh, there is a second level also. I have a spiritual side. And if I find a stairway by which I can get to that second level, then I can be safe. So that second level is a spiritual level. Normally we live at the physical level, but the spiritual level is also real. And processes like meditation are meant to take us to the spiritual level. So when, for example, before this talk, we were doing kirtans, this is musical meditation. And it is also one way by which we can raise our consciousness to the spiritual level. So if we practice meditation, and we regularly habituate ourselves to raising ourselves to the spiritual level. Then, whenever some tribulation happens, something goes wrong, and a thought of negative thought is just about thought train about to take off. Instead of getting carried away with it, we rise to the spiritual level. Okay, 
this is coming let me see how to respond to it so we get inner security and stability at the spiritual level and when the impulses come the impulse is the whole point of impulses you have to do this and you have to do this now like i came on the train station in a great haste and i was so e i was so anxious to catch the train that i was not thinking whether i was catching the right train similarly when the impulses come they just come up so fast you have to do it and you have to do it now they don't give us time to think if you just get to think then hey i don't need to do this so that distancing from the impulse so that we can think that happens by our spiritual practices so to the extent we can uh, regularly practice meditation <coughs> the mantra <coughs> acts like a spiritual elevator when we repeat the mantra it is like we are entering into the elevator and the elevator takes us up that way we can experience the spiritual level and we can experience calmness and clarity by which we can respond maturely to the external impulses and secondly what can we do if a particular thought train has come if i am very habituated okay some person speaks badly to me immediately i get depressed or uh, something wrong happens i get worried so if i have if this has become very strong within me the impulse and reaction has become very tightly bound then what do i do at that time there are basically two things which you can do at that time it may be very difficult to deal with it but if you look back okay that time this person said this to me and i became depressed what could i have done at that time could i have done anything oh, that time if i could have just stop that i could have checked the depression so so in the heat of the moment it's very difficult but in retrospection if you look back calmly and say okay i could if i could have stopped that thought train over there i could have protected myself so we look back at our life and see what are the situations in which the unwanted thought train start off say you know if a particular person is important to us and that person speaks negatively to us to us that's what depresses us or you know if something about our career that's something which we are very important for us if that is threatened that causes anxiety here i am talking about depression and anxiety i am talking about excess little depression little anxiety is just natural in life scores so if we observe then we can prepare if i if i'm going on a particular road first time i go say there is a bump over there i don't notice it and i get jolted but second time when i go oh there's a bump over there let me slow down so like that we evaluate and when we evaluate this is what happens these are the situations when i get triggered hmm? when i get the impulse to just get into a thought train and go off so if you understand those situations then we can prepare for them so how can we prepare how do we create that distance between the impulse and the response now all of us have to devise our own pause buttons we can't say no at that time saying stop or no is very difficult but pause so one simple way to pause is to take deep breaths okay when i'm getting worried when i'm getting depressed okay breathe in breathe out breathe in breathe out now what happens by breathing in and breathing out not just say breathe in not just breathe in breathe out not just say breathe in and breathe out actually get the consciousness focus breathe in breathe out so the the thoughts at the mind are going off here going off there going off there when i focus on breathing what am i doing i am getting the thoughts off the mental level i am getting them to the physical level focus on breathing focus on breathing and you will find that if you just say okay before i respond to any anything i am going to take 5 deep breaths i am going to take 10 deep breaths just breathe in breathe out breathe in breathe out you just do that that will interrupt the train of thought even if i got it okay breathe in breathe out hey i don't need to be in this train before it takes off let me get out so that breathing itself is a simple way in which we can we can disconnect from the images that are coming on our mental screen 
Similarly, uh, mantra chanting itself, as a regular practice, it can elevate us, elevate us to spiritual consciousness. But mantra chanting can also help us. Okay, just chanting them. Start chanting the mantra. Slow down, calm down. That can break. For some of us who are more intellectual nature, we can keep some wisdom quotes with us. Okay, when I get worried, you know, there are some good good quotes about how worry is unproductive, how worry hurts us, how worry is unwanted, unhealthy. And if we can just hear that that time, read it that time. Oh, I don't need to do this. One of my favorite quotes is that worry is like interest that we pay on loans we haven't yet taken. <laughs> worry is like interest that we pay on loans we haven't yet taken. The problems are not yet come. So why worry about them? When they come, we'll deal with them. So like that, if you just have some, so either breathing or chanting mantras or at a intellectual level having some wisdom quotes by which we can just break that. We can create a move between the impulse and the response. And if we just keep doing this regularly, we will find ourselves becoming increasingly empowered. All of us have been given certain talents. We have been developed, given some skills. And our education holds the talents, develops the skills. But our education doesn't help us much in developing our temperament. In developing our capacity to evaluate our thoughts and to choose the right thoughts. If we can develop this capacity, then whatever it is that we want to do externally, we will be able to do it with much greater effectiveness, with much greater success. So the capacity to choose the right thought train is our greatest power. And this is the power that will enable us to use all our other powers. Whatever talent I have, whatever skill I have, whatever money I have, whatever contacts I have, whatever looks I have, all these are valuable. But to tap them all, I need to be able to choose the right thought train. And our inner development, our spiritual growth can help us to choose the right thought train and thereby tap all our other powers. So I'll summarize what I spoke today. I spoke on the topic of tapping our inner power. So what animals are physically more powerful than us? And yet, we have overpowered the animal world. So on one side, we are much, some, there's something within us which makes us more powerful than animals. But something within us also makes us more foolish than animals. We destroy ourselves through suicide, through self-destructive habits, which even animals don't do. Uh, smoke uh, cigarettes or drugs or alcohol doesn't look like food. Uh, a bait looks for a fish. We still we succumb for it. So what is it? It makes us succumb like this. I took the metaphor of a thought of our inner world is like a th train station, in which there are many different trains that are there. And as soon as we invest our thought in any of them, invest our consciousness in them, the train shoots off. Like I, in my haste, caught a wrong train and ended far away from where I wanted to go. Similarly, we, by our impulses, catch wrong thought trains and end up sabotaging ourselves. So two major ways in which the mind creates problems is through depression and anxiety. So when the thought train goes off unfettered into the future and starts worrying about all worst case scenarios, that causes worry. When the thought train shoots off into the past and, and obsesses over all the bad things that have happened, that causes depression. To the extent we can pause and choose which thought train to which thought train to get into to that extent we will be able to choose wisely and act wisely and for evaluating this I took the other metaphor of a inner screen so the mind is the inner screen we as the soul are the inner seer and there's the outer scene so the inner screen for proper functioning should act as a window but sometimes it acts like a tv monitor goes off into the past or goes off into the future and it's not just one screen with one window. There are many windows open on it. And we need to make sure that the, the important window is maximized and others are minimized. Sometimes the unwanted window gets maximized and it starts displaying a movie and you get carried away. So 
the stronger our the the more we develop a habit for something that means that the window popping up and the action starting off there is very little time lag between them so the so the stronger the habit the lesser the time lag and then how do we break from this uh, being caught by our habits then we need to uh, use our intelligence to understand that i am not my thoughts we humans have a greater capacity than the animals to resist our impulses animals can't fast we can if we want to so uh, how do we train this intelligence by spiritual knowledge that i am different from my thoughts i don't have to fuse with, identify with my thoughts and then second i talk about is rising to the spiritual level so just as this friend who was trapped in the irma and the flood that came discovered the attic he was saved similarly if we amidst problems rise to the spiritual level then we can get calmness and clarity and the way to rise to the spiritual level there are many there, there are many forms of meditation we practice mantra meditation mantra acts like a elevator that takes us up and this is a regular practice which we can do and that will help us to distance ourselves from our thoughts and evaluate them and in emergencies when impulses hit us at that time we may get carried away but in retrospect if we see what are our triggers then we will be better prepared to protect ourselves and the way to protect ourselves is by developing a pause button so something which okay slow down the pause button can be deep breathing it can be mantra chanting it can be appropriate wisdom quotes when we pause then we will be able to evaluate and then we will make the right decision so we have various talents we have various skills which are we, that have got from birth or we have developed through education but we need to develop the temperament to go with it and our capacity to choose the right thoughts will be the will be our power that will enable us to tap all our other powers and thus by learning to to ascend the right thought train we can actually do justice to our talents and fulfill our destiny thank you very much thank you so much chaitanya like it's wonderful like it's like when i was hearing the talk i was like i never thought about this i have a train station right here <laughs> <laughs> and we actually have a choice to select which train we want to take so now i would like to open it up uh, if anyone has any questions yeah yes please we talked about um, so if i don't want to get carried away by say drinking alcohol but all my friends are alcoholics then if i stay away from them then i am being an esca escapist is it advisable to do that mm -hmm. okay so just have to move a little bit sorry just one minute okay we have few minutes so there is there is avoidable dangers and there is unavoidable dangers so in many ways the best way to maintain self control is to avoid situations that require self control that is the best way so for example somebody wants to, somebody has got diabetes and they don't want to they told not to eat sweet foods now if they keep sweet foods close to them 
just keep it in the drawer below them i'm not going to eat it maybe i just give it to friends when they come <laughs> i may normally think i will not eat but suppose suddenly i am i am working on my computer i am talking on my phone at that time suddenly i get snack attack <laughs> i get attacked by the desire for a snack now at that time if i have some healthy food as a fruit or some uh, carrot or some salad or something i'll take that but if that fatty food is there that's where my hand will go and i'll take it <laughs> that's simply unavoidable right i mentioned i was in google a few months ago no, not a few weeks ago so in google they did an experiment because software companies often most of the work is sedentary so there people tend to become obese and people get health problems so they wanted to cut down the amount of sweet food that people eat so they on the uh, advice of some experts all the um, in their cafeteria in the uh, all the sweet items that were there the chocolates or candies or whatever earlier they were in transparent boxes they just get paper coverings on those transparent boxes and not paper covering that advertise what is there <laughs> no just paper coverings that cover the, they do, you can't see what is there so still if somebody wants to eat the sweets they will order it and they will be given that but they found just by covering those containers almost 30% of the sales of candies went down and they found correspondingly people's diabetes and other problems decreased so many times some temp many times some some temptations are simply circumstantial if i am in that tempting situation okay let me enjoy it if it is not easily available okay i will not drink now it, sometimes some desires can be very deep rooted also if i have a strong desire to eat a candy i will go to a shop and i'll drink it i'll buy it and i'll take it psychologists call this propinquity propinquity means the effect of time and distance on behavior if some food item i want to eat it's readily available i eat it if i have to put a lot of effort okay maybe later so in general mm, the best way to maintain self control is to avoid situations that require self control now we can't always avoid those situations but if it is possible to avoid them it's best to avoid them and that's not escapism that's pragmatism pragmatism means why waste my energy on this it's a see our will power is not an infinite resource our will power is a finite resource and i resist temptation once twice thrice four times five times my will power resource is getting depleted and after some time it will be over and the same temptation which i would have resisted say in the morning then evening when the same temptation comes i'm already so tired just let me take something so basically uh, if we put ourselves in tempting situations again and again then our finite will power resource will get depleted and we will succumb so if uh, if you are going uh, if it's a formal occasion where there is a valedictory party or there's a professional um, celebration and there you are expected to go then going there and not taking drinks that's fine but if just a i uh, just a occasion for hanging out with people then there are healthier places to, to hang out and uh, we may some friends may hold it against us but there are others who will not you know if our friends don't allow us to be who we want to be or who we are then we have to rethink you know, are these the kind of friends i want to want to be with we want our our friends we don't want to force our friends we don't want to uh, moralize and say that they are doing something wrong that's not the forum for saying that but our point is that we want to be who we are so there's nothing wrong in avoiding tempting situations but we don't have to depend only on avoidance we also need will power we also need intelligence we also need strategies if i am in that situation how will i deal with it but it's not that no, not going into the situation is escapism it's simply pragmatism we conserve our will power so that it can be used for better purposes okay okay yes please
Yeah. Oh, um, I just want to say thank you very much. That was very, very insightful. Uh, my main question was, um, you, you talked a lot about, um, you know, we are not our thoughts and we are the, we are the seer, the observer, watching the screen of thoughts. Um, and I, for the past few years, have been practicing um, observing my thoughts to, to try my best to disassociate with any potential negativity. Um, but my main question to you is, generally, um, I find myself separating myself so much when I do that to the point where I'm... Um, I, I just I just get so introspective that it separates my, myself from other people and then I'm kind of misunderstood or it just yeah. Okay, I understand so your question, yeah. In terms of introspection with spirituality, um, how okay. how to find the balance between not not diving into the spiritual realms too much to the point where I'm not functioning properly in mm. a material society. Okay. Good question. So if we become too analytical about evaluating our thoughts, we may get so caught in, a, in that analysis itself that we may appear disconnected from people and we may not be able to function in the outer world. Yes, the Bhagavad Gita talks about three modes of material nature. These are three broad ways in which we function. They are called as Sattva, Rajas, Tamas in Sanskrit. We could English call goodness, passion and ignorance. What does this mean? We could say that we function in th three broad patterns. Basically in our functioning, there is the mental level or the inner level and there is the outer level. So when we are in the mode of goodness, there is contemplation first and action later. I first think, should I do this, should I do that and then I act. In the mode of passion, there is first action and then contemplation. Some people speak to express their thoughts and some people speak to discover their thoughts. They speak, ah, I didn't mean to say that, <laughs> slip of tongue. So what happened? The action comes before the thinking, so that's passion. However, there's a third mode which is ignorance, where there is neither action nor contemplation, there is simply delusion. We, we just get lost in our head. We want to evaluate what is going on in our head, but we, if we get too lost in that evaluation itself, that may lead to what we call as paralysis by analysis. So when that is happening, then sometimes we have to go into our head to become a better observer, better observer of what is happening. And sometimes we have to get out of our head to become a better actor, better function in the world. So if I am too much doing action, that means I'm in the mode of passion, then I have to rise up to goodness so that I can introspect and then I can act. But if I'm living too much in my head, then I have to rise upward to the level of actions. So we could decide that there are certain situations which are important for us where we need to evaluate and observe. But there are certain situations where more or less uh, not so much is at stake and where more or less we function reasonably well. So at that time we don't have to get into evaluation. Just let's act. We all have, I talk about impulses which are just, we just act and often act self-destructively. But conversely we also have instincts. Instincts are considered pro like programmed intelligence. Some things we just get it. Some people, they want to write a letter and Agonizing how to write this sentence for one hour. And somebody else they just come, you in two minutes they get the sentence. You write it like this. So that's that's very good intelligence, linguistic intelligence. So there are some things which we are good at. If I'm good at music, some players come come, they pick up an instrument and they start playing it. Now if they start analyzing at that time, that will affect their playing. And now there is a story that there was a centipede, a creature with 100 legs. It was dancing very gracefully. And then there was a crane which couldn't dance much. And the crane became envious of the centipede. And the crane, everybody's appreciating, oh, with 100 legs you dance so well. So then the, the crane asked the centipede that, 
you dance so beautifully thank you now i want to ask you a question see when you dance after you put your 96th foot down you know how do you decide whether to put your 97th foot down or to put your 95th foot down really i never thought about it <laughs> and the second we started dancing am i putting my 96th foot down now which foot should i put down and he said he getting so caught in the thoughts that he stopped, stopped dancing nicely <laughs> so some things which we are doing nicely as i say if something is don't fix something if it is working well so basically there are some things which if not much is at stake and something which you do reasonably well we don't have to analyze so much uh, so that way we just get into sometimes we have to get out of our head and into the world start acting and secondly we can also evaluate our evaluation that means which evaluation of thoughts is important for me because our inner world is also like a universe so if i come into this room right now there are so many things i can observe right now i can sit and start counting okay how many tube lights are there in this room you know or i can count out how many people can sit in this chairs in this room and that may be that may be useful in some other context but for me this is not important so just as when i come to a physical room there could be so many stimuli i could take in but i focus on the stimuli that are important for me similarly in our inner thought world also there are so many thoughts that may come in one thought of evaluation when i said is that okay is this the thought i want to go along or is this thought i don't want to go along that's one kind of evaluation but another is among all these thoughts i can't spend my time observing all the thoughts also i need to zero in on a thought that is important and then act on it so we may decide that we can create a finite time limit mm, psychologists have said there are two kinds of people there are select, there are maximizers and there are op optimizers maximizers means say if they want to purchase a new cell phone they want to get maximum value for their money so they will look at all the cell phones available in the market and they will got the best brand for their best best value for their money but sometimes you purchase a cell phone they may spend 3 months and they spend 3 months constantly looking 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 somebody else may say i want to buy a new cell phone and i will next one week i will evaluate and then i'll decide now generally maximizers get a better bargain than the optimizers but the problem is the maximizers because they have invested so much time and energy they have so much expectation from the product and if any small thing goes wrong they feel disappointed on top of that there is also always the regret what if there might there might be some better product if i had just investigated a little bit more i would have found a better product and sooner or later a better product does come up so they feel regretful at that time so they lose a lot of time and they don't even get happiness through it all so with respect to analyzing our thoughts also we have to become optimizers so that means okay this is this important for me so i'll spend this much time on it and sometimes i may come to with a wrong decision it's okay we all learn from life and we can never have a situation where in life where we'll always be making right decisions so we use our best intelligence make the best decision in the situation and then we learn from that experience so basically three points is the answer one is that we need to get out of the head sometimes if you are living too much in the head we need to evaluate our evaluation and in in dealing with our thoughts we need to be optimizers not maximizers can i ask you a question mm, thank, thank you, you. Yeah. yeah this is so i have uh, two questions coupled together yeah. uh, when you were talking about the self but destructive habits mm. so i wanted to have some clarity of course it will be a broader topic so when you talk about sex is it a bodily needs or is it a part of the control or is it a part of the self <coughs> destructive habit similar is a case for a, a, a non vegetarian food typically <coughs> so is it uh, me eating is typically going to avoid or uh, not assist me in reaching my spiritual goal okay so um, is let me take the meat question first is meat uh, eating meat an impulse that has self destructive is that going to obstruct us in our spiritual growth our spirituality is affected by what happens at the physical and the mental levels 
because spiritual consciousness is rooted presently through the body and the mind so we want to become more and more sensitized sensitized to what is happening at a physical level sensitized to what is happening at a mental level and sensitized to what is happening at a spiritual level mm. when we eat meat at a conscious or a subconscious level we are desensitizing ourselves to the pain that other living beings are going through mm. it said that if if slaughterhouses had glass windows nobody would be a meat eater if if we just go and visit a slaughterhouse and see the amount of pain hear the screams of the animals we would we would not want to eat i need to eat food but why do i need to cause so much pain to other living beings so basically meat eating requires a certain level of desensitization and that desensitization is what obstructs our spirituality becoming spiritual is means becoming more and more sensitized to both the physical reality around us and the spiritual reality around us but um, eating meat causes desensitization and that desensitization we shut off a particular aspect of reality and at a subtle level also when the meat is eaten or when meat is, when the animals are killed the they are filled with fear and anger fear that they are going to die anger at those who are killing them so those emotions get invested to subtle level in the food and they come into us and they may also affect our psychology that way we we'll become more fearful and more short tempered by that so as much as possible it is uh, it is good that we avoid meat and that will help our spiritual growth i have a i have a website called the spiritual scientist dot com where i have a elaborate article giving scientific reasons for this no how your eating can help the world so help is a acronym h e l p that actually eating vegetarian food is better for our health now if you can start your food please is it there in front of you now you can start yeah so you can help yourself <laughs> so <laughs> so h is in many ways Uh, for for uh, vegetarian food is much better than non vegetarian food is environment uh, for when we have to when animals are produced for slaughter uh, for making to meat the processing that goes in the washing of their bodies the washing of the meat all that causes so much water pollution and the air pollution that happens when they animals are produced in mass and then they give out the refuse which has to go into the environment it causes air pollution and land gets used also so so much of that so environment is can be we can actually decrease environmental pollution substantially by shifting to vegetarian diet l is livestock a livestock is that uh, all those animals they suffer so much pain and die they, that can be avoided and p is poverty even poverty at the uh, global level can actually be decreased how mm. by poverty i primarily mean starvation or shortage of food basically uh, the amount of land that is required for feeding one non vegetarian person is almost 10 times more than the amount of land required to feed, forget feed a vegetarian person but because there is a whole bio cycle because when animals eat food they may eat this many much grains and they, this much flesh will be formed which a human being can eat but if those that same land were used to raise grains for human beings then that much grains would be available to feed human beings so basically apart from the spiritual also there are several other reasons why meat would be uh, preferable to avoid and as far as sex is concerned is a sex a self destructive act uh, it depends on the context and the purpose sex is a natural biological function which leads to which is necessary for reproduction so it is a biological function but in human society there is a enormous psychological obsession with it it's a biological function which is there and animals also mate and they reproduce but in a in our human society because there is so much sexual provocation around us 
and our minds themselves are also provoked so we that is we don't use it as a biological function for us it has become a psychological obsession and so much so that often we artificially divorce the sexual act from its biological function that we animals engage in sex and they just procreate through that we want to engage in sex but we don't want procreation so basically it it becomes a psychological obsession as long as it is a biological function and it serves a biological purpose then that can also actually be a spiritual act because you know we we in the bhagavad gita says that sex life can also be divine because through the act of sex we are becoming co-creators with the divine in bringing new life into the world but when it becomes a psychological obsession that's divorced from the biological function then it becomes a serious spiritual distraction because the mind the consciousness which is meant to be directed towards the spiritual it gets caught in the sexual when can i get the next opportunity to enjoy where can i find the next partner how can i enjoy so when when it becomes a psychological obsession that is when it becomes spiritually harmful now of course when uh, sexual desires can become excessive that can lead to diseases that can lead to people becoming violent then there can if there is it can lead to the breakdown of marriages if people have affairs or things like that there are many other consequences also but from the spiritual perspective the main problem is that it can become a psychological obsession okay yes please Hmm. I feel like I'm able to minimize them, hmm. but they're still there. Yeah. And even though they're not in my mind consciously, they're in the back of my mind. And when they accumulate, I get sick, I get stressed. Even if I I don't think about that, and then there is a point. Where there are so many, I collapse, mm. and then they all appear. And they're usually things that are not in the future or the past, but they're going on, and I cannot control. So what? What can mm. I do with that? Yeah. So sometimes some unwanted pop-ups, they come, and if they accumulate, then they overwhelm us, and they cause us stress. Become stressed and to collapse, so they're just ongoing. Not so much in the present or the future. This ongoing. Then what to do? Yeah, it's a tough situation. Uh, I'd say two main things for dealing with such uh, accumulated pop-ups. That is that some things they may be, as you said, not maximized, but they are there in the. So now. if they're in the back they're in the background we can't get rid of them in the physical world i can decide not to do something for example i can if i touch this i find there's electric current over there i can decide i, I won't touch this but in the mental world i can't decide not to think of something if i tell you for the next 30 seconds please don't think of a pink monkey you can you can think of whatever you want but please don't think of a pink monkey now in your life you never never thought of a pink monkey but how you start thinking of it so even if i say i am not going to think of a pink monkey like just the resolution to not think of it is already a thought energy is subtle and if we consider thought energy as subtle energy that goes out and reaches the object of thought then our intention to not think of something has already caused our thought energy to go and touch that thing so not thinking of something is not possible for us but we can choose to focus on something else when these minimized uh these these pop ups are there which have been minimized but they are still there so as they when they accumulate they pop up they just zoom up at that thing so we can't not think of them but we need to have something 
constructive that we can think of that can increase our strength. So uh, if you like to say read some books of wisdom or hear some spiritual talks or do something which mm, increase the positive, positive energy within you. Mantra chanting is also one activity like that. When we do that, that increases the strength, our own positive strength. This negative strength is building, building, building. This is going on in our life, but we are not building our positive strength. So at one this point, this negative strength will zoom up. But if we can do at least regularly some activities that build our positive energy, then even if this negative energy goes up, we will have the capacity to resist it. And secondly, if say it's irritation, you know, one problem irritates me, second problem irritates me, third problem irritates me. I'm tolerating, tolerating, tolerating. But if 10 problems come up, then it just becomes too much. So if I have to carry a one kg weight, I can easily do that. If somebody, another kg, another kg, 10 kg, it's going to be difficult. It's going to be 50 kg, it's almost impossible. So when we have found something which are irritating us or which are depressing us, whatever it is, negative emotion that they have contributing, so we have to periodically let go of things. Letting go means that, okay, this thing happened. I accept that it happened. It's a mistake that I may have made. It may have been something which somebody did with to me. It's happened. I accept it. I let go of it. I let go of it so that I can go on with my life. So it's, it, it is a conscious choice to disinvest our emotions from it. People have hurt us, that's going to hurt us. But as long as our emotion is locked in it, that hurt will explode sometime. But if we disinvest our emotion from it, there is a higher plan to life bad things happen they may be for some good purpose i don't know at this stage i just let go of this then the, when the emotion is disinvested from it then that creates a new way of remembering it sometimes uh, life just gives us a raw deal it hurts so sometimes you may get a wound and that wound may leave a scar say so i have a scar over here now when I have the scar, uh, I can't wish away the scar. But when I got the, when the firecracker hit burnt me, at that time it was very painful. But now it is a healed wound. The scar is there, but the wound is healed. So it doesn't cause much pain, any pain in fact. Similarly, as long as the wound is raw, the pain will be there. So the same applies at the emotional level also. So if something has gone wrong and it's caused me irritation, then I need to I need to have some time and I process it and release the emotional energy locked in it. Okay, this happened. If we don't release that emotional energy, we are accepting it, but it is a grudging acceptance. Why did this happen? It shouldn't have happened. They shouldn't have spoken like that. They shouldn't have done like that. So it's it's a it's a grudging acceptance that is there, where we are fighting against it, but it's building, building, building. But we just, okay, that chapter is over in my life. Uh, I don't want to revisit anymore. It's so much spilled milk. It's water down the drain. I accept it and I move on with my life. This requires a conscious decision. And then when you do this, when you re learn to release the emotional energy locker in it, then it won't accumulate. One thing comes, it will be there. We release the emotional energy, it goes off. Second thing comes up. So after, I'm not saying the wound will not be there. The scar will be there. But it won't hurt that much. We will, uh, uh, the releasing the emotional energy invested in, locked in bad things, that helps us to recollect, that helps us to have recollection without agitation. As long as the emotional energy invested is invest, invested, locked in it, the recollection causes agitation. A simple example I'll give. It's a little subtle concept. Say if you have brought a new car and you're proudly going in that car, looking who all is noticing your car and you stop at a intersection and somebody just bumps against the car. Ah! It gets so furious. 
my new car what did you do to it now imagine say so you had a car and you sold the car and you are going in, in some other car and you see somebody riding your old car and then somebody comes and hits the bumper of that car how much agitation is there <laughs> it's not your car it is the same but because the emotions are not invested in it the agitation is much lesser so basically as long as we uh, are emotionally locked in that event at like the scar is mine even a small scratch will hurt but when i release the emotions i let go of it then uh, then it is like a car which is no longer mine so whatever you say is a burden you could envision it this way that okay this particular event is burdening me this particular event is burdening me this particular event is burdening me now you can chant the mantras pray to the divine and then please let me i want to let go of this please help me to just whatever happened it's over let me let go of this and you can imagine that thing stuck on your head it's falling off this one thing falls off the second thing falls off third thing falls off fourth thing falls off i let go of it if there somebody has hurt me i forgive them for it this bad thing has happened i accept it so this way when the acceptance moves from grudging to graceful i move on more in my life then you will find that those replays won't those uh, negativities won't accumulate they'll stay for some time when you release they will just become things which you recollect without getting agitated the tansi question So, what are the levels of existence? Broadly, there are three: the physical, the mental, and the spiritual. It's like if I have a computer system, there's the hardware, the software, and the user. The physical level is like the hardware. The mental level is like the software. The spiritual level is like the user. So, the um, most of our scientific progress has happened at the physical level. where we have been able to in more and more avoid uncomfortable situations and create comfortable situations it may be cold but i can create air conditioning i can i can this way we have progressed the physical level a lot in many ways but most of our progress has eluded at this mental level at the mental level we have decreased our cap- the mental level is the level of thoughts emotions intentions it's also stimulated by recollections so the mental level perceptions come in from outside recollections come it from inside and whatever comes in as a stimulus either from perception or recollection it starts off as a thought then becomes the emotion it becomes the intention that's how the th- thought train takes off at that level the capacity to manage our thoughts has gone down substantially we are not worked to deal with that so thoughts emotions intentions recollections perceptions all these are integrated at the mental level and at this level if we learn to function better then we can uh, be much happier otherwise we will be comfortable at the physical level but miserable at the mental level so we will be you can say comfortably miserable <laughs> which is sadly a state of many people today now beyond this is the spiritual level the spiritual level is the level where we originally exist so that means like i earlier said there is a seer there is a screen and there is a scene outside 
so the seer is who we are the seer is the spiritual level of reality and all of us have a longing for life eternal and love eternal most of the movies and novels majority of them are about romance and most romance talks about hea happy ever after that's an innate longing of the human heart now if you look around the world there is nothing that is eternal when the twin towers fell it was not just the falling of a tower it was the psychological impact something which is a symbol of security and strength and prosperity that collapsed so so nothing around us lasts forever even the big big mountains they are not going to be there forever so when nothing around us lasts forever why do we have a longing to last forever where does it come from if there's a child who's living in a in a remote african village or a remote african tribe with no connection with the rest of the world and suddenly one day the child goes to his mother and says mummy mummy i want a pizza <laughs> the mother will ask for some where did you hear about a pizza so there's no where around in your environment you could have heard of a pizza so similarly nothing around us lasts forever still we have a desire to live forever we have a desire to love forever where does this desire come from it doesn't come from our externals it comes from our, the deepest internal level within us it comes from us as souls the soul by nature is eternal but the soul's consciousness is currently projected onto the physical and mental levels through the through the mental to the physical level that is why we are trying to seek the eternal at the physical level we are trying to increase our life span we try by various ways to avoid death so this longing for eternity stems from the spiritual level and at the spiritual level we are finite units of consciousness and there is a infinite consciousness this infinite consciousness is known by different names in different traditions but there is an eternal bond of love between the finite consciousness and the infinite consciousness and realizing and relishing that love is life's ultimate perfection that is what will fulfill our longing for life forever and love forever so the, so we are souls who are on a multi life journey of spiritual evolution we are meant to evolve so that we our consciousness rises from the physical through the mental to the spiritual level and we become situated at the spiritual level when we become situated at the spiritual level then we attain eternal life so the eternal the spiritual is the level of reality where we belong and it is the level of reality for which we long so to the extent we live our life presently in a way that furthers our spiritual evolution to that extent we will have contentment during our life journey and we will also have the ultimate attainment at the end of this life journey does that answer your question Thank you very much for your attentive participation and for your thoughtful questions. Thank you. So, thank you so much, Chetan Sir. That was such an enlightening talk, and also the way, like I was, we 